Astronauts Butch Wilmore and Cindy Williams spoke today about whether they felt let down by Boeing and the Starliner after their capsule was deemed too risky to use to bring them back to Earth. Let down? Absolutely not. Not never entered my mind. Uh, I don't think Sonny's either. And it's a very risky business, and things do not always turn out the way you want. Separation confirmed. The capsule came down to Earth without them last week. The two test pilots will stay at the International Space Station until late February. They have to wait for a SpaceX capsule to bring them home then. Joining me now is Dan Riskin, CTV science and technology expert. Thanks, as always, Dan, for joining us. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. What do you think of uh, the comments from them? Any surprises? I, believe them. I, I, I think they're sincere, and I think this is... Um, I think what, what we can look back on this as is sort of a failure to sort of control the narrative by Boeing and by NASA. Uh, because those astronauts never spoke, uh, we sort of had to infer what they must be thinking. And so when the narrative became, oh, they're trapped in space, they can't come home on their spacecraft, uh, you know, what would that be like? Oh, gosh, I've watched Gilligan's Island. I can imagine it'd be very frustrating. <laughs> and so, you know, the narrative sort of took on its own path. And now NASA and Boeing are really trying to rewrite that and try to sort of claim the narrative again. And I think that's going to be it's an uphill PR battle. Uh, rocket science not is not as difficult as PR. And they've got the rocket science stuff figured out. In fact, I would argue that the Boeing mission was in many ways a, a complete success. Uh, they, they had to test the spacecraft. They, they precisely did that mission to find out if there were any mm -hmm. sort of issues with that spacecraft, and that's exactly what they managed to figure out. They managed to identify problems that need to be worked on. And then when it came to bringing them home, they were not pinched into a corner where they had to take any risks and put them on a spacecraft that they were a little nervous about. They were 99% sure everything would be fine, or, or probably a number higher than that. Um, and the spacecraft did make it back, and it, it, they would have been totally fine on that ride, but NASA played it safe. And so there's really no no big failure here, and there's no big disaster, and they're not really stranded. It was really just a, a decision that puts these two astronauts in the place they love most for eight months instead of uh, five days. It's not a bad job if you can get it. But is, is there almost uh, too much of an emphasis on, I, I don't want to dis, uh, dismiss it, but is there almost too much of an emphasis on safety when you're doing something as risky as this? Uh, well, I mean, the safest thing to do with space travel is to not do it, right? It is to stay on Earth and look at the stars and say, you know, someday will, somebody will take a risk. But that's just not, that's not in the cards. There, there has to be a level of risk. And where that needle falls is tricky. And so if you leave it to the astronauts, they're going to be able to say, I'm willing to take this kind of risk. I'm willing to put my life on the line, things like that. But when you put it to the administrators and it's their job to make that decision, it's a lot harder for them to justify making that kind of a call. And after, you know, the, after the Challenger disaster or, or you know, the other space shuttle that, that ripped apart on reentry over Texas, um, you know, people lost their lives. And those were ultimately decisions by the administration to, to, uh, to sort of look past potential issues and failures of the entire organization to report potential issues up to the top. And so they've really made a big point since those two disasters the Challenger, that's the word I was looking for. It's the mm -hmm. Challenger disaster that, that blew up. Um, so they've, they've really made a, a big uh, effort since then to show that they've learned from that. And this was a chance to showcase that they really do put an emphasis on safety. So I think for, for NASA, it was a success in that they said, you know what, we could have done it, but we take the lives of our astronauts so seriously that we, of course, would not put them at risk. And this just shows how great our culture is. And so I, I think it was a good PR move for them, as, as difficult as the whole stranded PR piece has been. And uh, I, I think it was the right call. Could they, send, could they fix the Starliner and send it back up remotely and pick them up? Is that a possibility? I think that would be a more expensive possibility than what's already in the cards. So they'll come back on a SpaceX. The real question is, will Starliner go up again? And so Boeing, uh, man, no shortage of troubles at that company. No. Um, and, and lots of different pieces falling off of that wagon as it rolls down the hill. So uh, Boeing needs to figure out what they're doing and get, get things sorted. But I think it's better for space travel if there are multiple companies that can provide rides to the International Space Station. It's better for everybody because you have competition in the marketplace, you have innovation, and you have redundancy. And so uh, I think a lot of people are really hoping that, that that still works out, and a lot of people are invested in a future that includes Starliner. And honestly, the issues that it had, um, if they're going to be able to sort those out. Those are engineering problems, and these are rocket scientists. This is what they do. <laughs> they're they're going to be able to work that out. It's just the PR game that becomes difficult. How do you convince people that it's safe? How do you convince people that that's a good investment of money, uh, especially when the voting public has to decide who gets elected and how they allocate public funds? And so 
Um, th th I think that's where the real question mark is. All right, and before we go, so what are they going to do now? They're up there for another five, I think about five months roughly. W you know, they're going to garden, maybe play some cards. Uh, yeah, it's, they're not. It's not like being stuck at the cottage for for a few extra months. This is uh, this is. They're going to be hard at work, and they already are. They've they've gotten right into the routine. But actually, the most interesting piece is if you're going to space for five days, you don't really have to worry about it's your body. I mean, you're going to go up there, and your body's going to be fine. You're going to come back, and you had a good time. If you go for eight months, you're going to come back. You're going to be a bit of a mess. And so they have to really ramp up the exercise, and and I believe they've already done that. But they need to be running every day. They need to be doing. Uh, all kinds of different exercises just to try to keep their bodies in shape because when you come back from space after eight months, that lack of gravity just wreaks havoc on so many parts of the body and people have trouble standing up uh, when they get back from Absolutely. a trip like that. So uh, we'll see, uh, you know, what that's going to be the big change to their routine is to make sure they're taking care of their bodies. All right. And William's hair is absolutely magnificent in space. <laughs> It is. It is. I mean, I, I guess that's the benefit, right? It's, it's eight more months of, of Beyonce hair. <laughs> All right, Dan. Always a pleasure, sir. Have a good one. You too. Thanks a lot.